Coming up on Tech News Today, Zynga kills Draw Something creators. Well, the company, not the actual people. Intel's Merrifield bid for dominance and Verizon getting the NFL. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, June 4th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Samsung, Galaxy, iPhone, and other smartphones are worth at gazelle.com. And by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with colleagues and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face-to-face -face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30-day free trial today. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code TNT. And by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zakta. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we're, we're spanning the continent the past couple of days. Sarah Lane in New York, myself in Los Angeles, I as in Jason, up there in San Francisco. And we're still talking about the top tech stories of the day in the news feed. Intel showed off its next-gen mobile chips at Computex in Taipei Tuesday. The Merrifield will succeed the Medfield kind of a little close there with the names, as the smartphone system on a chip. That'll come out early next year, promising better performance and battery life as usual. Baytrail will come to tablets, and they say the price will be around $399 for those tablets by the end of this year. And Intel showed off its first LTE modem, the XMM7160, which will work with Baytrail and one would assume eventually with Merrifield as well. Zynga is laying off 18% of its workforce, or about 520 of its 2,900 employees, in order to reduce 80 million in staff costs and stay competitive in the mobile gaming space. As part of the cuts, Zynga is closing offices in New York, Los Angeles, and Dallas. So Bloomberg says that HTC just lost its chief operating officer. Now, normally I'd say look for him in the couch cushions because that's where I lose things. But what it actually means is that its COO, Matthew Costello, is leaving the position in, in the company. Fred Liu will, will fill in for Costello as COO. Costello will stay on with HTC as an executive advisor. U.S. President Obama plans executive action against patent trolls on Wednesday. The Wall Street Journal reports the president will instruct the Patent and Trademark Office to create rules requiring the disclosure of a patent's owner in addition to its inventor. Expect five executive actions and seven proposed legislative changes that aim to curb abusive patent lawsuits and divert patent decisions away from the International Trade Commission. The Dell XPS 12 got a nice update with the latest Intel 4th Gen Core i series has well processors, which gives the XPS over two hours more battery life than before, that's according to Dell, and a significant graphics boost due to the integrated Dell HD 4400 or 5000 graphics. Storage options include a 512 gigabyte solid state drive and eight gigabytes of RAM. The new XPS 12 starts at $1,199 or $1,199. Let's take a look at the Department of Justice versus Apple ebook price fixing case. Now, the DOJ asserts that emails and statements made by Steve Jobs are proof that Jobs was the ringmaster of an ebook price fixing conspiracy. Apple's attorney, Oren Snyder, argues the DOJ is twisting and mischaracterizing statements made by Steve Jobs to his biographer, Walter Isaacson, and others. Snyder says that Jobs knew his statements would be read by millions of people, and there is no way that should be construed as unambiguous admissions of price fixing. The ringmaster. IBM got cloudier today, agreeing to buy public cloud computing infrastructure company SoftLayer Technologies for almost $2 billion, according to Businessweek. IBM plans to combine its existing private cloud unit, Smart Cloud, with SoftLayer to create a new cloud services division. The deal is expected to close in the third quarter of the year. Today, Microsoft and 343 Industries announced Halo Spartan Assault for Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. The new game is due out this July, although no specific date has been announced yet. The game will also retail for $6.99 across all platforms supported 
comprised of 25 levels. But something to note, if you purchase the title for Windows Phone 8, you can't play the game on your PC. You'll need two copies if you want to play on both platforms. Google Reader shuts down in less than a month now, and the top contender to replace it, Feedly, is rolling out new features. Feedly announced partnerships with third-party RSS readers like Reader, R-E-E-D-E-R, -E -E uh, Press, Newsify, G Reader, and NextGen Reader as all part of an API project called Normandy. Feedly also announced it will make its service available in all web browsers. Currently, it only works with extensions in Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. European Commissioner for Digital Agenda, Neely Crows, outlined Europe's proposed net neutrality guidelines. ISPs would not be able to block or throttle services that compete with their own, like VoIP. ISPs would also have to tell customers what is included in their service and what speeds they can expect. The plan now will either be presented as a legal recommendation or a regulation. A legal recommendation could be implemented by December. If it's a legal regulation, it could take until 2015 before it's a law in the EU member states. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Gazelle. You want to make some cash? You got some old gadgets? Gazelle's the place to do it. Hassle-free. You don't have to worry about all kinds of complicated things you got to do. It's simple. You go to their website. You say, look, you don't even have to say this, but let's say you want the HTC One or maybe the Samsung Galaxy S4 or the iPhone 5. All you do at the website is put in the, the gadget you're getting rid of. And then you tell them what condition it's in. Uh, they'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads sometimes. And then they'll give you a quote. You lock that quote in for 30 days. You've got a month to figure out your new phone, transfer your data, get all comfortable with the new phone. Then you send the old phone. You still get the price you locked in 30 days ago. As soon as Gazelle gets it, they turn it around and they send it to you. You can get paid fast by check, by PayPal, or get an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. Gazelle's now buying back a larger selection of tablets, too. In addition to the iPad, you can sell Samsung, Google Nexus, Kindle Fire, Microsoft Surface, Asus tablets. So go to gazelle.com right now. Find out what your iPhone, your Samsung, your Android smartphones are worth. Some of those tablets. Take a minute, find out, and then sell your used Samsung Galaxy or iPhone today at gazelle.com. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the stories of the day. Very happy to have Scott Budman, business and tech reporter for NBC in the Bay Area, back with us. Good to see you, Scott. Thank you. Good to be here. Let's start off talking about the Merrifield chip. Uh, we mentioned it briefly in the news fuse. Uh, they showed it off at Computex. Three times peak performance, five times lower power is what they claim. Of course, none of this has been benchmarked independently. It's going up against Snapdragon Exynos Tegra as the system on a chip for smartphones. Now, we're not really going to get to see it uh, for a while. It won't be coming until next year. It gets a sensor hub, though. That's the uh, power saver for things like your GPS, your accelerometer. So that should help with the power savings. And uh, they're going to have an in-house phone, they say, at Mobile World Congress in February 2014. So we'll actually get our hands on one at least that early, if not before. Uh, Bay Trail tablets are coming sooner, though. They're, they're saying they'll be priced around $399, so not super cheap. Uh, but they will come with the XMM7160 LTE, LTE modem in some cases. And that's been a big holdup for Intel, is the fact that they didn't have LTE. Both these chips, Merrifield and Bay Trail, based on the Silvermont architecture, that's 4.7 times less power, 22 nanometer, 3D structure, that FinFET structure, uh, makes it more efficient. They, they actually build up, not just out. Out. Does this change anyone's opinion about Intel versus ARM? Intel's really been working hard to try to get into the mobile processing space. They haven't yet. They had a nice big announcement with Samsung. Scott, what do you think this means for Intel's prospects in mobile? Well, the prospects need to get better. You know, you saw that headline that you just posted there. Intel looks ready to compete in the mobile space. That says volumes about why Intel and its stock price have stalled so much. I mean, they're late to the game. They need to be in the mobile game, like all the good software makers and all the good hardware makers. This is Intel's strength, and it's sort of like we talked about with the original California Gold Rush. If you made the tools, you were successful. In the dot-com rush, if you had the servers and the back-end things, you were successful. Uh, right now, if you've got the chips for the smartphones, or like Google and Android, if you have the software for the smartphones, you're successful. Intel has not been successful in the mobile game yet, and uh, maybe this will get them there. Yeah, that's the, that's the big question. I ask, when you look at this stuff, do you say, like, this is what they need to be doing? It's definitely what it's they're doing what they need to be doing. Uh, to your original question, does it change opinions? I don't think it changes any opinion. The opinion right now is Intel needs to get into mobile. They've been trying to do this for years. They lost out back when Apple was introducing the iPhone. They could have been inside of that if they had put together a good enough deal. And the thing is, 
Intel processors have always been power hungry, and that's been an issue for mobile devices. So the thing is, with Intel trying to do this and their deals with Samsung and the fact they have a Motorola phone, I believe, in Europe, these kinds of steps are good first steps. But as we're seeing with the new CEO at Intel, uh, Brian Krasanich, he seems to be moving quite aggressively. And I would, I would believe that Intel wants to be in mobile as soon as possible because, as Scott's saying, if you don't get in now, you're never going to be able to get in because these operating systems are built to run on ARM. So if you're going to have Intel chips, you have to convince the uh, operating system makers to rewrite their software, and they've done that with Android. Well, and that and that's the thing, right? You you we know they need to be into mobile. Scott's absolutely right about that. We know that they're these are certainly the things they should be promising: power savings and and uh, better performance uh, to get manufacturers on board. But what do they need to do to get manufacturers to use Intel chips? Because right now, ARM, uh, you have a nice choice. You have Snapdragon, you have Exynos, you have Tegra. Uh, either one of you guys, if you have a, a best guess of what Intel could do to turn some heads and get manufacturers to start really adopting Intel and more than just sort of an experimental one-off here and there. I think arguably Intel has to buy a company or partner up with one. Like maybe they should go out and buy HTC or something and say, look, we're using Intel from now on. Or they have to come into their own manufacturing process because unless they actually have a product that people are using that's amazing, I don't think any company is going to switch without being paid off, quite honestly. I agree. I was going to say the same thing, although I was a little hesitant to say, oh, you have to go buy a company, but I think he's right. I mean, there's so many good choices. Like you said, Qualcomm is doing huge business because it managed to get in there and be successful, something that Intel, I'm sure to its embarrassment, has not been able to do. All right. Well, Blackberry's out there. They're not up for sale technically, but <laughs> right. you, know, you got some Intel push. Maybe you could go out there and pick somebody up. All right. Let's talk about uh, Lenovo. Actually, uh, speaking of BlackBerry, uh, g mentioning some kind of possible deal. Do we know actually who they're partnering up with for a smartphone? No, we don't. What we have is news from Lenovo with, within a clarification announcement made by Lenovo to its shareholders. And the document says the board of directors of the company noted certain articles published in the internet in relation to a possible joint venture arrangement between the company and a party on smartphone business. The board would like to inform the shareholders of the company and potential investors that the company is in preliminary negotiations with a party in connection with a potential joint venture transaction. Now, in the past, Lenovo has been linked to BlackBerry. There were rumors that BlackBerry was going to get bought by Lenovo and shares jumped like crazy for BlackBerry. That deal turned out to be untrue right now. Maybe there are negotiations with that. Scott, the statement's really vague in who Lenovo could be teaming up with. So let's get really creative. Who do you think they should team up with? Should they be with Intel, like a, a processor maker? Should they be with BlackBerry, a hardware maker, a software maker like Microsoft? Do you have any, I, any guess? Well, it's interesting. You know, you, you mentioned Lenovo is a hardware maker and sticking to the sort of dance with who brung you, they make hardware and they do it well. They make inexpensive hardware and they do it well. So they could uh, partner with a BlackBerry, perhaps on a low-end phone or even a Nokia that used to sell a whole bunch of low-end phones. Um, but you're right, it would be a little more intriguing if they were to partner with a software maker that could really use some help in the hardware space. Um, but gosh, let's be honest, there's so many choices already in the hardware smartphone market that do we really need another one? Uh, or do we just need a push, you know, to get some better software in there? It's 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 kind of interesting. I don't know that we need yet another smartphone maker. Tom, we know that uh, Lenovo's smartphones are doing quite well, Android-powered, in China. Uh, do you think this deal, would, this potential deal, could be about bringing Lenovo phones to other uh, areas in the country, in the world, that is? Yeah, we know Lenovo wants to do that. Uh, they, they've indicated that before. But it seems like they could do that easily as with Android phones without doing a joint venture. I'm not sure what they get out of a joint venture unless it's feature phone related and they push into an emerging market. Uh, and I could see potentially a Mozilla partnership. Uh, you know, Mozilla's out there really pushing their OS as a low end, uh, above feature phone, but below top end smartphone operating system. And they have struck some partnerships before. So maybe it could be that. Uh, obviously, BlackBerry is the most obvious one that might be willing to do some kind of joint venture to ease themselves out of making all the hardware themselves. That seems to be the most likely, although I'm not sure what Lenovo gets out of that joint venture necessarily, unless, like you say, maybe it's access to the United States market in an easier fashion. Certainly BlackBerry, as many troubles as they've had, sell more phones in the United States right now than Lenovo does. Sarah, what, what company do you think that Lenovo should team up with should they bother to go with a joint venture? 
Well, you know, Tom, you mentioned that uh, Lenovo might want to use BlackBerry as kind of like a piggyback company to get back into the U.S. market. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, isn't Lenovo pretty prevalent in the U.S. market already? I mean, I don't really see why something as, uh, you know, kind of volatile as BlackBerry has been over the last couple of years would be a great partnership for Lenovo. I guess I don't have... I don't have the the magic company that that sounds better than that. I guess BlackBerry probably is vulnerable enough uh, to maybe uh, be an attractive partner for Lenovo, but I'm not sure what Lenovo, the company, could w- would get out of it because Lenovo seems pretty strong. So I would think Lenovo would get potential, uh, I guess, relations with countries. Uh, BlackBerry is quite ingrained in the U.S. government, Canadian government, and uh, enterprise. Lenovo is very good at that when it comes to ThinkPads and laptops. Perhaps this could be an entryway that way into the smartphone market. On top of that, I would think Lenovo wouldn't have to bother with its software engineering. They can stick to the hardware side of this and let some other company, like BlackBerry, who picked up the, uh, QNX, let them develop the software to a level that is uh, it's just better than they could possibly do. Maybe Lenovo doesn't want to put resources towards the software development, and maybe they just want to go with hardware. Because Lenovo does have some software. I've seen it on their laptops. I've seen it on their Android phones. And they're less than spectacular. But QNX is a really baked-in operating system right now, and perhaps BlackBerry's sp- expertise in that could help a, uh, an entry into more markets. Now, I think Sarah makes a good point. Lenovo has a big brand right now it's not in smartphones yet but but people know that it's like oh they make good electronics that would be attractive to blackberry to kind of hitch a ride on that but again i'm not certain exactly what black what lenovo gets except maybe access into carriers and stores and and all of those mechanical things that they would have to forge anew because they don't have smartphone presence in the united states at this point let's skip on down to google's app store uh downloads Google has uh, announced uh, some 48 billion downloads in May. Uh, Android apparently gets about 2.5 billion apps downloaded per month. AppBrain estimates that Android apps available in June are about 700,000 in the store. Uh, Apple in May said that they have 50 billion downloads. That's a couple billion in front of Google Play. 2 billion per month. 850,000 iPhone apps and 350,000 tablet apps. and as Simco looked at all these numbers and said, you know what, we think that Google Play is probably going to pass iOS App Store by the end of June in the number of apps. Uh, now, iOS and device users still have more apps per device, 83 apps per device, according to Simco versus 53 per Android. But it is logical to assume Android will pass iOS and apps downloaded by the end of June. There's just more Android devices out there than iOS, even though there may be fewer apps downloaded per device. However, revenue, still 23 cents per iOS app. We don't know what Play Store makes, but that's a nice hefty sum going along with selling apps in the iOS app store. Scott, do you think any of this would shift developers to an Android first strategy? Yesterday, we saw Vine come out finally for Android months after it came out for iOS. We're kind of waiting for people to go Android first more often. You know, what I hear from the developers, it's not about money why they go iOS first. It's because the iOS is a little bit simpler and in some cases cleaner. And so if you start there, you can then make the shift to Android. But you're right. I mean, you can't argue with the sheer numbers of Android devices out there. And while Apple has a really good thing going with how much money it makes per device and all that stuff, again, there are just so many Android devices out there. I think what this whole thing speaks to is that whether you're Apple doing what Apple does best, or Google doing what it does best, they're hitting that mobile market very, very strongly. At the top of the show, we talked about why Intel wasn't doing what it needs to do to get into the app market, or excuse me, the mobile market, and certainly Zynga has swung and missed many times trying to get its product into mobile phones. Uh, But Apple doing well, we've talked about that a lot, and Android really doing well. And do they shift to an Android first? Maybe just because of the sheer numbers, but again, the developers I talk to say it's a little simpler, and a cleaner process to go iOS first and then make the adjustment to Android, as Vine has done. Sarah, do you, uh, you're back, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I've, I've given up on Wi-Fi altogether, so I'm on LTE on my iPad right now, which is a lovely iOS app, by the way, for Skype. So you're uh, using an app as we speak. Uh, so, yeah, what, <laughs> exactly. what, what do you think of this? I mean, I, I, Scott brings up a really good point. The developer environment on iOS is still often preferred by developers. People debate about it, but it, that generally seems to be the case. Uh, is, is, it all, is it about numbers and money, or is it just about the ease of creating the app? 
Well, you know, for a long time, we've heard um, if you're a developer uh, per download, you'll make the most amount of money on iOS. So that's obviously attractive. But at the same time, it seems now as if, and maybe I'm nuts, and I'm sure Android people will 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 be annoyed with me for saying this. But you look at something like, yeah, sure, Instagram or Vine. Those are just very two very high profile apps that were on iOS for an extended period of time and got a lot of attention before they came to Android. But that happens with a lot of apps. And often it's apps that are considered uh, sort of uh, well-designed and innovative. And there's, there, it's a, there's almost like a prove yourself on iOS first. And if you can do that, then once you come to Android, that's really where all the people are. I mean, that's where you get all your crazy numbers. And there's kind of a proven model there already. And maybe it matters less. Um, it's it's iOS is the proving ground, and then Android is really where your growth explodes. It seems like that that has happened enough so that that's a trend that a lot of developers are just following. And yeah, it's it perfectly logical to assume that Google Play will be a lot bigger, a lot bigger than iOS, and in, in not very long at all. So, Ayaz, what does this do to the fanboy debate once uh, once Google Play can say they have more apps? Uh, I would imagine absolutely nothing. It would just make uh, it's going to make uh, the the iOS fanboys go. Well, we have quality apps, and uh, Google will be like, we have more apps, and it doesn't really make a difference on the fanboy fights because that's going to continue no matter what. I think the big thing with iOS in general is this, the uniform nature of the devices. That makes it a little easier to develop. Apple's got really strict guidelines when it comes to how your UI is going to be. So there's less thinking sometimes when it comes to a Apple development. Then again, Google has really upped their game with Google I.O. and they showed off these new developer tools, which makes it a little easier, or actually a lot easier, for developers to see what their app will look like on multiple uh, displays because Android phones have such a varying uh, uh, degree of sizes. The other thing is that Play Store got redesigned as well. Google's doing a great job trying to spotlight apps because before it was kind of muddled. It's kind of hard to find things. Google's also curating the store a bit more. They're throwing out the, the junky apps. So I think as all of these steps are moving forward, it's the better store experience that's going to get uh, more apps in those stores. All right, we will get to the Zynga story in just a second, but let's take a break and uh, thank our sponsor, Go to Meaning. People we work with the most aren't always the people we see every day. Co-workers work on the go, different offices. We got people in New York, people in Petaluma. I said San Francisco earlier, meaning the Bay Area. And of course, P. Delahanty and I as are in <laughs> Petaluma. It's kind of Sonoma County, really. Anyway, uh, co-workers are all over the place. Clients spread all around the globe. To work efficiently, you need to have a stronger connection to your team, to build trust, to stay focused, to brainstorm. You want to look people in the eye. That's why we use GoToMeeting with HD Faces for our meetings. The powerfully simple way to meet online and see each other face to face with GoToMeeting by Citrix. Your team's just a click away. You share the same screen. You collaborate in real time. Just turn on your webcam. Make your online meeting an HD video conference, and it feels like you're in the same room. You can see people's expressions, read their body language, launch or join a meeting from anywhere. Use your computer, use your smartphone, use your tablet, even do presentations right from your iPad. Uh, we, it's amazing how much difference it makes when you're on a phone call and you're like, wait a minute, I, I'm trying to guess what this person is trying to say here. But when you can see their expression, you see they're smiling, you see they're frowning, it makes a big difference. Difference. So try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. Visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button, and use the promo code TNT. Remember, use that promo code TNT. GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Also, want to thank everyone who tweeted their answers to our question. If you could have a meeting with anyone famous, living or not, using GoToMeeting with HD Faces, who would it be and why? Very happy to announce the winner of the new webcam in that contest is Patrick Wolf. Uh, he said, I would use my new TNT webcam to have a nice long GoToMeeting video chat with Thomas Jefferson to get some ideas on how to fix U.S. Congress. I'm, you know, as soon as we can do time travel with GoToMeeting, we'll get you on that, Patrick. I think that's a good idea. So congratulations to Patrick. Remember, don't forget, try GoToMeeting free today. Congratulations to Patrick on the free webcam. All right, Sarah Lane, let's talk a little bit about mm -hmm. Zynga and uh, their 520 employees who are no longer employees. Yeah, so Zynga, as I mentioned earlier in the show, laid off uh, over 500 employees, 520 of them, which is 18% of what Zynga you know, has, ha has 
has had as, as, as their employee count thus far. Not only that, but they're shutting down offices in New York, offices in L.A., and offices in Dallas. Uh, their headquarters are in San Francisco. What's interesting about the New York office is that it's basically just the OMG Pop staff. Uh, about a year ago, in fact, almost to the day, Zynga bought OMG Pop for $180 million. That was at the height of Draw Something's uh, uh, fadness. Um, it, was a, it was a big yeah, yeah, popularity. It was a big game. Everybody was playing it, and and it really was only a big deal for not very long after uh, Zynga uh, bought the company. And Zynga has apparently just shut down the studio, so it was effectively Zynga uh, New York. Mark Pinkish sent out a memo to employees. Uh, All Things D had reported uh, before it was official that this was going to go down, but it's definitely official, and he says... Uh, that this is really about saving cost. Uh, we can save about $80 million uh, by, by, by cutting these corners. Uh, in the same memo, Pincus has defended the Farmville franchise as still very strong. He notes the success of Farmville 2, says that Zynga's future is multi-platform and mobile, uh, which is no huge surprise. Uh, but you've got some OMG Pop employees who have been tweeting about being laid off some of them, you know, had nice things to say. One in particular, uh, VP of Outreach, Ali Nicholas, had tweeted, thanks, Zynga, for again reminding me how not to operate a business, which is, you know, tensions run high when people get laid off, and wow. sometimes people say things, you know, based on based on emotions. Uh, Kara Swisher over at All Things D says, you know, Zynga has a lot, they're worth a lot less than they were when they went uh, public. They went public at around $10 per share, now they're, you know, hovering a little bit below $3. She says, with $1.6 billion in cash, and they've got some marketable securities, investors are looking at the company to be worth below $750 million. So this is just a really huge drop for what was, you know, even though we all kind of shook our heads wondering why Zynga was as big as it was and, and, and made as much money as it was, at one point, it was an extremely valuable company. So, you know, I guess, Scott, I'll start with you. I mean, how does Zynga stop its freefall? Do you think saving $80 million in employee costs is the answer? No, it's not the answer, but clearly they needed to make some cuts. I mean, Sarah, I've been covering Zynga since it was a small startup and watched it grow and grow and grow. It hit a wall after the IPO and clearly wasn't going to make money, and clearly the stock price was down, and yet the company continued to grow and grow and build a giant headquarters add staff, and it just didn't add up mathematically. And yesterday, the company admitted that it had to cut back. And I think it's going to probably have to do that for a while until it can get to the point where it's making money to afford to buy more companies like OMG POP without running out of cash. Uh, and those are the ones that generate games, um, you know, the popular games that you talked about. Uh, I, I, I just don't see when this becomes a viable model. And it is a little bit surprising because for a while they were doing so well and it looked like they were going to get into mobile. I must admit, I play Words with Friends all the time on my mobile phone. Um, and yet, I don't check out the ads, so I don't make money for the company. And I imagine there are a lot of people like that. So this is a model that needed to make a lot of money as it grew. It just didn't. And I don't know how it does other than, let's say, you know, the whole uh, legal gaming thing that's been uh, swirling around that company for some time. I as you know, Yahoo just paid. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that was background noise. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yahoo just paid uh, three hundred fifty million dollars more for Tumblr uh, than what Kara Swisher is says. Says Zynga is worth at this point. Zynga still makes a lot more money than Tumblr, though. I mean, is this just a matter of getting into a market and not accurately? predicting how quickly it had to move to mobile? I don't know if or that's... Or is this sort of indicative of, of companies overpaying for other companies? Uh, I don't know if it's indicative of overpaying. I think the big problem with Zynga is pretty much the management, it seems like. They had a real lock on a social network gaming, and they could have easily moved into mobile because they had a partnership or at least a friendship with Facebook, uh, and they could have really used that to their advantage. It seems that Zynga going with their IPO, going public, it seems like the real problem seems to be at their management level, and what they're doing is they're creating this culture at Zynga that seems to be frustrating its employees. They're laying them off. Obviously, this is not going to be good for employee morale. 
theoretically, maybe it'll make the company leaner and they can move forward. But the thing is, if that management doesn't change, it's not going to make a difference. Even if you have like 20 motivated people, if the people up top are making their life, you know, living hell, they're not going to want to be there. And what's going to happen eventually is that if you see, let's say Yahoo goes out and buys Zynga for a couple of bucks because they are floundering, perhaps the strong leadership of somebody like Marissa Meyer could help this kind of market turn around a little bit because it's not that Zynga needs to like win over everybody. What they need to do is keep their inertia. That's all they need to do. They've got millions and millions of users. So if they could just get their act together management-wise, perhaps that would help them out. I wouldn't buy Zynga if I were Yahoo. I would, I would, I would, if I were going to get into this, I'd, there are so many other companies that are doing it better, maybe not as big as Zynga right now. But I think Zynga has shown that if they can't even make OMG Pop into something uh, and they end up having to basically discard that investment. Uh, I'm going to wait until Zynga shows me they, they're capable of doing something beyond Farmville before I would spend any money on them. Let's, uh, let's move into the uh, Google Glass app platform uh, where people are experimenting with all kinds of apps. I, as they're allowed to do almost anything they want, they're but to not do, everything. They're allowed to do less according to a, an update to the Glass platform developer policy. Over the weekend, either Friday, Saturday, Google updated its Glass platform developer policy. It prohibits content that contains nudity, graphic sex acts, or sexually explicit material, and any glassware that violates this policy will be blocked from appearing on Glass. Now, the first Glass pornographic app launched on Monday from a company called MyCandy, and the app's name is NSFW, so I'm not going to say it. Uh, MyCandy only became aware of the new developer policies after its app was launched. I just want to be clear. The app's name is not NSFW. You're saying the name it's not itself safe is not for safe work. to say. Work, right? Thank you. <laughs> okay. I can't say <laughs> it right now. I am rushed with a Justin Robert Young. Yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to cause confusion there. Uh, on a blog post, My Candy says it wasn't alerted about any policy changes, and then when it received its glass kit, that they were developing an app within the terms. Now, My Candy says it's going to change the app to comply with the new policies, and a new version is coming soon. Scott, is this kind of control good for Google Glass? Because Google's really hands-on when it comes to this particular piece of hardware. When it came to Android, it was pretty much the Wild West. And, and yet, uh, and this is a good point, I guess. I think this is something that is just so new that we don't even know where it's going to settle. Remember when uh, iPhone apps came out and Apple did eventually say, hey, you know, you can't put porn on there and, and certainly sexually explicit things uh, were sort of a no-no. Um, and, and I think we're just so early in what a Google Glass app is that they have to just sort of say some standards. Uh, I, I'm not surprised that sexually explicit content is a no-go, although having tried Google Glass a couple times, I, I can't imagine how arousing that would be to squint your way through that, but maybe it's just <laughs> kind of I'm, I'm old and don't have the vision I once did. But I've seen some apps that are very clever uh, for Google Glass um, and that make a lot of sense if you're walking around and have this sort of thing on. But yeah, some standards, and, and not just when it comes to explicit content. I think they have to ease the concerns of privacy advocates right away because it is a little disconcerting when someone's wearing glass and looking at you. If they're on their smartphone and looking down, okay, perhaps they're being rude, perhaps they're looking at something. But to not know what they're looking at when they're looking at you, I think Google has a big wall to climb when it comes to trust in the public when it comes to these things. Uh, and, and they're going to have to address that pretty quickly before people allow even conversations with someone wearing Google Glass. Sarah, when Glass Launcher was first revealed anyway, a lot of people made jokes, so people are just going to be using it to watch pornography or to view explicit things. Should Google be controlling what exactly goes into Glass this early in the game? I think it's really dangerous, actually, you know, and, and I, I, I know everyone's going to be like, you're just a big porn person and you want to watch porn on your Google Glass, but I mean, think of photography apps uh, that would be really cool on Google Glass. I mean, a lot of that stuff, there ends up, you know, pornography creeps into that. Tumblr blogs, there's all sorts of pornography on that sort of thing. And and these are, you know, these, these are sort of accepted programs and services on pretty much any other platform, web platform, mobile platform. So yeah, if you get into a situation as Google saying, well, no, 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 we said no porn and this is, somewhat on the fence, so we're just going to go ahead and block that, you're going to get people starting to say, well, hold on a second. Why isn't this the case in the Google Play Store, for example? Um, you know, why why is Google acting like Apple? Um, and if it's, you know, if, 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 if this is an extreme case, um, this, this company, MyCandy, has a name that, you know, we can't even say on the air right now because it's not appropriate, 
well, maybe they put themselves out there a little bit too much and, and got the wrong kind of attention. So they're being made an example of. But it's kind of a slippery slope here. And I think Google needs to be careful. It's the developer edition, though, don't forget. And Google's got to be careful about what gets the headlines for Google Glass at this point. I think that's what's driving yeah. this decision. So hopefully your your concerns will be allayed, Sarah. But it's a good point if, if this were to be the policy going forward. All right, let's finish up with the NFL. Verizon reportedly close to a four-year, $1 billion deal. What, what are we going to be able to get out of this deal, Sarah? Well, um, uh, it's going to be awesome, Tom. So, you know, Verizon and the NFL already have a deal. Um, but according to Sports Business Daily, uh, the new deal would be a four-year, $1 billion contract for Verizon to stream every NFL game. So that's, you know, already uh, that Verizon's NFL Mobile Premium will let you stream games on Thursdays, Sundays, and Mondays for five bucks a month. The new deal will also include Sunday afternoon games on CBS and Fox, and then all of the playoff schedule for for the you know for the entire NFL. What's interesting is that it's a big jump in how much Verizon is paying. Uh, Verizon would pay five times what it basically it's paying right now, which is about fifty million dollars per year. But that's still a ton less than what TV networks uh, pay for the rights to. NFL broadcasts. For example, last year, the TV partners signed nine-year deals. Um, some of them pay about the same amount per year that Verizon would pay for the life of this billion-dollar contract. ESPN, for example, pays about $1.8 billion annually. Fox and CBS both pay over a billion dollars per year. Okay, Tom, finally, let's get to your question. So, so what do I get, right? Okay, I want to do this. That sounds really good. The problem is, is that you can, as a Verizon customer, and of course, that's the number one thing you have to be, you can stream every game on the NFL schedule, but you can't stream them to just any device on Verizon's network. Supposedly, it's only restricted to certain mobile phones. Uh, the NFL mobile app for iOS is universal, so that would apply to iPads as well. But you can only stream live games to an iPad if you also sus subscribe to Verizon Fios or Cablevision cable service. It apparently won't work if your iPad is Wi-Fi only. Doesn't mean that the service won't stream over Wi-Fi, but if you don't have a data plan on your iPad, it's not gonna work. Uh, doesn't support video out over HDMI, doesn't support AirPlay. This kind of turns into one of these things where it's like, okay, so basically a very small amount of people who might be mobile, who want to watch a game every once in a while on their mobile phone, will be able to watch more NFL games. Scott, who is this helping? Is this like, a, you know, a, a niche niche market or am I missing something? I think Verizon is missing something because no, it's not a niche market. It's a humongous market of football fans who want to watch the games on the go. This reminds me of some of the Sony deals that sounded good, but were only if you had certain computers and certain services and all of them crashed and burned. A billion dollars is a lot of money. Good for Verizon for thinking of this, because if they didn't do it, you know, the train has already left the station. Netflix would have done it or something like that. But other companies like Netflix would have done it on a whole bunch of devices. Um, so this is how you come up with a good idea, but then fail. Because I have an iPad, but I only have the Wi-Fi version. I imagine a lot of people fall into that category. I don't have Verizon Fios, um, and this might not be reason enough to get it. I, I'm very surprised that they're... Uh, making it such a niche thing because it is a gigantic market that really should be tapped. Good for them uh, for coming out with it, but you need to hit all these devices. You kind of need to be agnostic um, in order to get people on board. You know, Netflix doing very well with some of its original programming, sending it to all sorts of devices and making people want to subscribe because they have all of those devices. So you need to spread that out, uh, boy, especially if you're spending a billion dollars. Ayaz, do you agree with Scott? I mean, a billion dollars is a lot of money. Is it worth it for Verizon to say, hey, we did it before anybody else did, but you're extremely restricted on which device you can use? And no, this isn't just getting NFL on your big living room TV as a cord cutter. You need to still have, you know, a cable subscription and 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 you, you can't you can't really be as as unrestricted as it might seem at, uh, at first. I think what it's what it would allow Verizon to do is differentiate itself some more versus its uh, competitors like AT and T. And, uh, and the others right now. Verizon's got this, one of the strongest LTE networks, but the other companies are starting to match them there. If Verizon has exclusive content on their mobile devices, I think that could be somewhat helpful. 
I can only see this being very useful maybe while you're waiting in line at a bank or you're tailgating or something. I really don't see a ton of practical applications for this other than saying Verizon, official mobile partner of the NFL, which people pay lots of money to do. They're official soft drinks of NFL. I don't understand why that even exists. Uh, if Verizon has a billion bucks to just throw away at the NFL, it's usually not a bad thing. The NFL makes a lot of money, gets a lot of eyeballs, and if they'll probably make that money back based on the extra package you'll have to pay on your Verizon bill to get that. I think it's funny is we're all reacting, and I had this first reaction too until I heard you guys talking about this saying, gosh, Verizon, why aren't you delivering this to my television? Because that's what people want. And I think what Verizon would probably say is well, that's not what we're buying. We're not buying. The, we don't want you to put this on television. That's not the point. What this is is buy a Verizon phone because if you want to keep up on the game while you're out and about and busy, you'll be able to do it on the Verizon phone. You won't have to buy a Sunday ticket. You'll have that access. I already get that with the NHL. Because I'm a Verizon subscriber, I can access certain games. I can access something called Verizon on the fly that moves from game to game to game when the season was still on. Uh, and the play there is not to replace your home viewing. The play there is, hey, when you're out and about town and you want to check in on the game, you can do it with Verizon. But I... I do think it's kind of, you know, it's trying to put the genie back in the bottle saying, well, we're going to restrict it to prevent you from air playing this to your television because we only want to use it this way. I think I think it's kind of silly. Let's move on to the randomizer. That's not silly. Actually, it is kind of, well, I don't know. This, this is useful. IBM uh, now employs <laughs> autonomous temperature monitoring robots built on the iRobot Create platform, the folks who brought you the Roomba, to just kind of, Wander around, check on temperatures, make sure that the data center isn't getting too hot, too cold. Actually, it, you map it 3D to determine cold spots where cooling is being wasted. So too cold is a real concern there. Uh, it's not vacuuming. Is that a problem? Only if there's a lot of dust there, I'd imagine. But since it's built on iRoomba, that means IBM went out and bought stock uh, uh of robots, I guess, and then I probably bought them at a discount since they bought a bunch of them. But they use a netbook and a webcam. Just just seeing IBM, I know they do a whole bunch of research, but them hacking together something out of stock components, that's probably going to save them millions of dollars. I'm just intrigued that IBM even bothers to do this. They could have employed people. I know that probably would be better for the economy. But they're building robots out of stock parts. That's freaking awesome. I agree. Good for them. Good for them. They it could have used lasers, somebody in the chat room pointed out <laughs> earlier, to which I responded, put the lasers on the Roomba or the yes. iCrete. Yeah, and then you get the best of both worlds. Actually, then they probably rise up against us, so maybe that's a horrible idea. You dress them Let's, up as sharks. You just have to get the Roombas like to work faster, you know? Roombas are really cool, but you need some, you need, they need some time. So if, the, if IBM could figure out a way to, like, hack them and then have them like speed around hunting down overheating that would be awesome this is why they're going to rise up against us right here this requirement work faster <laughs> let's take a quick break thank our other sponsor for today's show share file by citrix save my bacon a couple of times because you're constantly collaborating with coworkers, your clients you're sharing files contracts spreadsheets and presentations i i, I get this i get people sending me files that aren't mine. There's another Tom Merritt out there who's an architect. And every once in a while, I get plans for like a church basement remodel or somebody's house extension. I'm like, ah, I shouldn't be looking at this wrong Tom Merritt. You want to avoid those situations. That's why we recommend ShareFile by Citrix, the easy to use business solution that allows you to exchange files quickly and securely. ShareFile specifically uh, allows you to control who sees it. You can send files of almost any size and you can see when they logged in. Make sure that the right person got it and only they saw it. And that they actually looked at it. That's what I use it for. Make sure my accountant isn't lying to me when they said, oh, yeah, I looked at all your tax stuff. No, you didn't. I got ShareFile. A ShareFile, like I said, files of almost any size, no bounce backs, control who has access, and access the files from anywhere, your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone. I want you to try ShareFile with our special offer. Sign up today and receive a 30-day free trial, no obligation. Go to ShareFile.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter TNT. Remember, visit ShareFile.com. Type in TNT, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. What's happening on the calendar today, Sarah? Well, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Metro PCS is going to start using T-Mobile's network and GSM handsets on June 12th. 
the wiki pad is slated to be in your hot little hands at least if you're in the u.s on june 11th it'll be uh, 250 dollars there will be a worldwide launch to follow this summer the HTC One has been confirmed by Verizon for a release date late this summer. No specific date, but, you know, late summer, I guess that's what, June or, or I'm sorry, August or September. And Legendary plans a shoot for uh, Warcraft in the first quarter of 2014, as in the movie. Warcraft the movie, I'm very excited. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. We got a message from Belinda. This is, I'm going to use her words, dudes, we actually had the Atari ET game. It is not a myth. It was very hard to do. I remember that much. I also remember that ET falls in a pit, which is nearly impossible to get out of, which makes the garbage pit possibly amusing. We bought ET, the ET game in Florida, brought it to Arkansas, but unfortunately we sold it at a garage sale many years ago. So someone in Arkansas has an exclusive or an elusive ET game. Well, Belinda, it looks like you just lost a lot of money there, but it's interesting to know you played E.T., and it's, well, kind of lousy. Yeah, we knew it existed. In fact, I've seen copies of it, but but the fact that they had to shove them in the landfill and now we're going to uh, go back and re rediscover them through documentaries <laughs> is pretty crazy. Thanks for the email, Belinda. Appreciate that. All right, uh, that is the end of our show. Scott Budman, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, always great to have you along. Let folks know where they can find more of you online. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you can hit me on Twitter. You can uh, see me on NBC, wherever. Uh, always looking for good story pitches. And thanks again for having me on today. You guys do a great show. Absolutely. Uh, and thank you. It's a great It's great to have you on. We'll definitely want you back yes. as soon as you can. Anytime. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Uh, don't forget our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, to vote on stories. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260 TNT show. Also, don't forget our hangout June 12th, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. And tomorrow, we'll have Mark Million on the show. See you then. Yeah.